If you're a frequent PNW Haunts and Homicides listener, you probably already know we're Birdie Ambassadors. We wanted to take a quick moment to tell you a little bit more about this awesome product. Birdie is the modern personal safety alarm made for women by women. In a situation where you feel threatened or unsafe, you can simply activate Birdie's loud siren and flashing light to create a diversion. Birdie is perfect to carry anytime because the device is lightweight and comes in a variety of colors. So important. Use our ambassador link and coupon code PNW Haunts and Homicides to receive 10% off your purchase. Like our social media handles, the coupon code is all spelled out, no special characters. You can find the link and promo code in our show notes or PNW Haunts and Homicides link tree. Have, Have a, a safe ass, ass day. day! As indie podcasters, we love to show our support of other awesome shows. So stay tuned for the promo we've got to share with you this week. Let's show them some love. You can find their info in our show notes. Hey there, all you true crime listeners. That's Kylie. And that's Mary. We are the hosts of Sipping with Snapped. Yes, another true crime podcast. (laughs) What makes us different? We're a mother-daughter duo. Holla. While enjoying the beverage of the episode, we learn about the quote famous to the obscure true crime cases. We also sprinkle in some movie quotes. And whatever else we think is funny. (laughs) So check us out. (laughs) Find us on your favorite podcast platform. Remember, listen to your mom when she's talking true crime. Make good choices. (laughs) We are Sipping with Snapped, a true crime podcast. Cheers! Hi, Cassie. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, creepy people. Hi, creepy people. Yay, we're here. So we're back in Canada again today to continue onward with the case of the Highway of Tears. I'll remind you that we're talking about a variety of victims that are generally discussed in broader conversations about the case. Some are officially linked to the Highway of Tears and some are not. Uh, Some are indigenous and others are of a Caucasian background. Um, We'll talk more today about why that's such an important point in these cases, specifically whether they're linked to the Highway of Tears or not. Yeah. So 15-year-old Ramona Lisa Wilson was murdered because that's what I talk about more often than not. Oh, her name is so pretty. I know. It's a really cute name. Ramona Lisa? Yeah. Oh. Her body was discovered about a year later near Smithers Airport after she went missing June 11th of 1994. Her family has never forgotten her. Her murder, though connected with the Highway of Tears, has never been solved. Hmm. Her mother, Matilda Wilson, spoke on the anniversary of Ramona's disappearance at the site where she was discovered. Oh, my gosh. She said, I'm lucky. A lot of people don't know. Yeah. And I'll be honest, that one... um, in hindsight, taking a second to process it, it makes complete sense. But it was a little bit of a thinker for me when I first read it because I immediately jumped to, well, this is an unsolved murder. But 
at least she knows what happened to her. Yeah. They have the body, you know. They can just bury her and... Yeah. I mean, so obviously that's her, you know, speaking to, referring to the recovery of Ramona Lisa's remains. But it just took me a second to get there because to me, you know, my brain just goes to, you, you know, just heartbroken for them that they really still don't know. Yeah. Which is devastating to hear because the only closure that they have is just that, the discovery of her remains. No sense of resolution or justice. There's just really no explanation. Not to say that you can ever get a good one. Ramona's sister, Brenda, has often reflected upon the strength of her mother in the face of such immense grief. Ramona Lisa was Matilda's sixth child. Wow. Yeah. She was born in Smithers, B.C. at the same hospital as Delphine, actually. So we talked about her in the last episode. I mean, it's a pretty small town of about 5,000 people, after all. But I just thought, wow, these two girls, you know, born in that same hospital. Mm. Matilda had been told that she wouldn't be able to have more children after her previous child. She sure showed them on that foggy, wintry day when Ramona was born, February 15th of 1978. Brenda was so excited to have a little sister. Her brothers adored her. They didn't just humor her when she invited them to her tea parties. They heartily attended and sipped delicately. Oh, that is so sweet. Her no. brothers, too. <laughs> yeah, her brothers. Oh, such good big brothers. Yeah. In Matilda's family, she was the first child to be born outside the family home, following their move to a more highly populated area, complete with a hospital as well as RCMP assigned to the area. So where she had grown up previously they did not have a hospital they did not have you know a police force to speak of wow so quite rural rural juror (laughs) you said that very good she didn't even mess it up (laughs) this was preceded by the devastating loss her parents experienced of a young toddler to pneumonia oh no i know But tragedy, unfortunately, would knock frequently at Matilda's family store. She was put on a train to a residential school at age five. She was assigned a number, and she learned English very quickly. She was assigned a number? What does that mean? Like you're in prison? They did not refer to them by their given names. The children? Yes. What the fuck? Why did that just hit me so hard? Oh my god! That's because so it's sad. very indicative of images that most of us probably conjure up in relation to Auschwitz. Jesus Christ! Okay, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, unlike many other children taken by the Canadian government at such a tender age, she was eventually reunited with her parents. But the separation and abuse had affected not just her, but also her parents. Hmm. They had taken to drinking heavily, and thus their familial relationship would never be the same. Matilda's parents would both be gone before she reached the age of 30. Her mother of a heart attack, and her father tragically having been struck by a drunk driver. Oh my god. Still, she wasn't entirely without family support. She had married at 15 and had five children by 21. What? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Sadly, she would be widowed just a few years later, (laughs) making her a single mother. What? Oh, my God. Caitlin, (laughs) you didn't warn me before this one. Yeah. Still, she persevered. Her youngest daughter, Ramona, 
she was delighted to learn, wanted to be a psychologist. Oh. She thought in this field that she could get into people's minds to help them. When she shared her plans for the future, Matilda couldn't have been more thrilled. Instantly motivated to help guide her, she encouraged her to pursue this goal. Ramona likely would have attended college classes at an institution in Victoria as she worked towards a degree. She was a talented baseball player and a reliable employee at a local restaurant washing dishes. Though Ramona would prove to be a bit of a lackluster student in terms of attendance, at least. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, known to occasionally cut classes. Was it high school, though? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she probably just yeah. wasn't I, interested anymore. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a pretty common youthful yes. rebellion. She had future plans. She was. Yeah. Wanting to do that. Yeah. That's what I think. The night she went missing, she was supposed to meet her best friend, Crystal. When she didn't show up at the gathering as they had agreed, Crystal wasn't concerned, assuming she must have gone to a different party, which would have been completely a plausible idea because there were a ton of different parties and festivities for the end of the school year and graduation. But sadly... June 11th of 1994 would be the last time Ramona was seen by her loved ones until her body was discovered. Mm. A small group was out on their recreational vehicles. I'm thinking four by fours, but it's not totally clear. And obviously it super doesn't matter. Yeah. (laughs) Just shy of a year later on April 9th of 1995, Ramona's remains were found after one of the vehicles became stuck, leading the party seemingly by chance to her body. Oh, my gosh. It didn't get stuck on her body, right? No. Okay. Okay. I was like, what? No. Um, what happened was they basically, one of their you know vehicles got stuck. They went venturing into the woods to see if they could find something to use as like kind of a wedge to, you know, yeah. get it out. And that's how they discovered her. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. A few items were found near the remains. A segment of yellow rope, three white nylon cable ties, a purple sweatshirt, and leggings. Mm. The police identified her by dental records, and the entire family showed up to view the items that were found at the scene. It was confirmed that they were indeed Ramona's, but that her shoes were missing. Matilda and other family members scoured the area looking for the shoes, but they were never recovered. Wow. They were brand new shoes that Ramona had, and Matilda was adamant that, like, Those were the shoes she was wearing. Wherever she went, those shoes went with her. We have to find those shoes. Police informed the family that the crime was clearly sexually motivated and had likely occurred where her daughter's body was recovered. Oh, so they didn't even move her? They took her directly to where they would leave her body. Ramona was buried in the Smithers Cemetery, which was less than two kilometers from the very hospital in which she was born just 16 years prior. Wow. Her best friend, Crystal, had spent countless nights desperately seeking any information from her seemingly uncooperative Ouija board in an attempt to get answers about her friend. Oh, my gosh. To which I say, Crystal, I get it. We know you're hurting, but as we've discussed previously, the Ouija board is never the answer. Oh my gosh, I just can't. Like, I can imagine being that young and like, you just need answers so badly. Guys, get you a crystal. 
and I'm not talking about the rocks. <laughs> you need both the shiny, sparkly kind, but also the warm, fuzzy, friend kind. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're going to circle back to Crystal, but probably not for any of the reasons you might suspect. Um, are you going to literally kill my heart? Yeah, but it won't be the reason you're thinking. Okay, all right. Roxanne Tiara was born in Manitoba and was placed in the care of Mildred Tiara. Until she was a toddler, she would live alternately with her birth mother and in foster care. Roxanne attended grade school in BC and was a happy kid. Mildred said that she and her family had always considered Roxanne as being part of the family. She reconnected with her father at 12 years old. As a preteen and teenager, like most do, she began to exhibit moodiness, some behavioral issues, and started hanging out with a bad crowd. Yeah, don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> Roxanne met Crystal in a juvenile facility at the tender age of 12 and was clearly far less worldly. Yes, this is the same Crystal that knew Delphine oh. from the last episode and Ramona, who we just talked about. Wow. Crystal said Roxanne had been afraid to leave her cell, which may have had something to do with her naivete in past dealings with other kids held there. Oh. You see, she was overall a very innocent young girl compared to most of the other kids in the detention facility and she had been known to tattle on some of the other older kids for their rule breaking or minor infractions and while she hadn't initially been savvy enough to keep quiet she did quickly realize her safety could be in jeopardy oh no yeah that's not good <laughs> yeah <sighs> making friends with crystal gave her access to guidance from someone more experienced with surviving and even thriving within the juvenile system and helped her to endure the remainder of her time there. Hmm. I had hoped in vain that maybe Roxanne would carry the goody-goody mentality through to her release and go on to live happily as a background character, but as you might imagine, that was not the case. And all of that's not to say that because she didn't stay on the straight and narrow that that's any excuse or rationalization for anything that I'm about to say. Yeah. No. Following Roxanne's release, her behavior took a turn for the worse. But that's teenagers for you, yeah. honestly. At times... Coverage of the cases linked to the Highway of Tears focused, and arguably what you can still find out there, focuses on aspects of the girls' and women's lives that seem to attempt to explain away their deaths. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. But when Roxanne's remains were found in August of 1994, she was no less dead than any other victim. She was no less deserving of justice. Her family and the other people in her life that loved her, no less worthy of answers. And if you're, if you'll excuse me, I have to scream cry for a few minutes now. It's a unique hybrid I have developed through working on this case. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, I'll leave the room. <laughs> Later, Crystal was dragged in by the RCMP to explain how three of her friends had disappeared in the last four years. Which, call me crazy, but that kind of seems like their job to figure out. They brought this kid in and asked her why three of her friends are dead, like, or well, missing. They, they well, have a... <laughs> it's just crazy. Like, obviously she's... She's been through a lot. Leave her alone. Yeah. Delphine, who, as previously discussed, went missing in 1990, 
Ramona Wilson, just four years later. Then finally, 15-year-old Roxanne Tiara, just one month after Ramona. Oh my God. But here's the real mind fuck. They obviously felt like she knew something or maybe even was somehow responsible. The police left her feeling guilty, traumatized, and deeply saddened. Later in life, it would leave her feeling distrustful, disillusioned, and ultimately disappointed in the efforts that law enforcement had made in the cases. Oh, and probably also angry. Yeah. This poor girl knew three of the missing and or murdered young girls, and they're bullying her just because she's a juvenile with a record. Mm -hmm. Why they thought questioning her in a hostile manner would be helpful to them, I can't say. Especially since they'd had every opportunity to speak with her in the cases previously. But they didn't? Nope. Oh, okay. Not, nothing <sighs> more than just a cursory... Nope. Wow. And they went from, huh, so this girl's friends with all three of them and wasn't important enough to talk to at length to interrogating her. That is crazy and so, like, jarring for her. Yeah. Wow. Teresa Umphrey's murder in Prince George wasn't attributed to the Highway of Tears, but it was horrific and very reminiscent of a crime attributed to Keith Jesperson. Oh. Okay. Her family wasn't allowed to see her because of the gruesome violence perpetrated on her body. Mm. The man responsible is also responsible for the death of Marnie Blanchard. He was arrested, but because authorities didn't have enough to hold him for Marnie's murder, following his release, he killed Teresa. Brian Arp was arrested after Teresa's body was found. DNA evidence linked him to both crimes. In this case, I hesitate to say they're some of the lucky ones, but at least their cases have been solved, despite a bit of stumbling. Mm. What's unfortunate are the cases that haven't been solved and also don't fit into the mold created to categorize a case as one of the Highway of Tears murders in the way that matters. Now that we've talked about these cases, you might be tempted to think, I forgot about this idea of a task force that I brought up earlier. And that would be a decent bet in a fair few situations. Unfortunately, you couldn't be more wrong today as it happens. Remember how Nicole's disappearance seemed to really light an investigative fire back in 2002? Yeah. Well, it wasn't until 2006 that the ball really got rolling. And I know you'll be shocked to hear that it still wasn't exactly an effort headed up by law enforcement. What? How, how long does it take? <sighs> how long does it take and how hard do people have to fight? Yeah. Because that's what it comes down to here. At the 2006 Highway of Tears Symposium, over 90 community organizations were represented. Wow. It was an incredibly powerful event, but many that were a part of that movement state that there hasn't been much in the way of meaningful change, at least certainly not in the way envisioned in the days of the symposium by the participants. The inception of the EPANA division, which communicates with victims' families related to disappearances along highways 97, 5, and 16, seemed like a promising step. But if you had a creeping suspicion that that alone wouldn't be a silver bullet, well, go ahead and give yourself a gold star. Okay. 
the task force's caseload doubled in the year following its inception. Wow. It doubled? Mm -hmm. But wait, it gets worse because doesn't it always? Yeah. Sorry, guys, but if you were waiting for your daily dose of positivity, I think your GPS navigation system is clearly malfunctioning. (laughs) Not here. No. Maybe we can come up with a new segment that serves as a bit of a palate cleanser to help you out. But for now, as the Brits say, keep calm and carry on. (laughs) We're here with you, so. Now, I've been telling you about the cases from the decades and areas associated with the Highway of Tears and letting you know which ones were officially linked and those that were not. That was an oversimplification until we could get to the part of the timeline where we would discuss EPANA to give you the full scoop. So here are a few boxes that you have to check in order to ensure the EPANA is going to be working on your specific case. Number one, the victim of the disappearance or murder must be female first and foremost. Okay. Number two, they must also be engaged in what the task force, or EPANA, described as high-risk behaviors like sex work or hitchhiking. Number three, and must have gone missing from and or their body located from in specific stretches connected to the highway. This one actually makes sense to me, but we know not all of the victims that could be associated with one or more serial killers active in the area would fit neatly into this mold. I'm going to try to cover one such case in the very near future, possibly. Okay. There are non biological females as well as entire groups of people that have gone missing but they were mixed within that group so if you have a woman and a young boy who go missing or are murdered, and they fit all of the other criteria, they cannot be officially assigned to the task force. Okay. Because the little boy breaks that mold. Okay. Like That doesn't make sense, but... Here's what I'm saying. We shouldn't be looking to use a Band-Aid for someone with a broken leg that's on fire and rolling downhill at a steadily increasing rate of speed. Are you sure? Certain. (laughs) Because I'll be honest, I think that's how a lot of the families feel. And they're not too pleased, to say the least. No, I wouldn't be. (laughs) There are a lot of families that are upset that they can't seem to get any movement. There's no headway on the case of their missing loved one because it doesn't fit into that mold. So like I said, the EPANA task force quickly doubled their caseload from the initial nine that they took on. And that's based on the very narrow criteria described. 13 are murders, five disappearances between 1969 and 2006. 10 are victims of indigenous descent. And all of that had me wondering, and probably you too now at this point, what the hell do we do? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of grassroots work being done. And to quote another awesome podcaster, 
Let the women do the work. (laughs) Honestly, it's unfortunate, but as far as I can tell, that seems to suit the RCMP and Canadian government's approach all too well. And not in that good way. The Highway of Tears walk started at the same time as the symposium. In fact, many participating in the walk who had intended the journey to be a much shorter stretch, originally, they kept on walking until they made it there. Wow. And Ramona's mom was one of those people. They intended to walk a stretch of the highway near where Ramona's body was found. And they just kept walking. Wow. They're strong, amazing individuals who found a way to use their pain to fuel them physically and empower others while protecting the memories now colored by tragedy for so many. They walk the highway in groups with chaser vehicles for safety, stopping in towns along the way where locals often generously offer them lodging or meals to show their support, all in order to honor the victims. Many of those that participate in the annual walk are family members and friends of the women and girls that have gone missing or been murdered, but it doesn't stop there. The nurses from the hospital in Smithers, where both Delphine and Ramona were born, have joined the walk. Oh. People wait for the walkers to approach in each new town or community, and they join them for a leg of their journey to show their support. Oh, and I'm ugly so crying. <laughs> I know she is. I can't look at her. I don't know why. It just gets me that it's like the nurses at the hospital where they both were born. Yeah. I don't know why. Because it's like even they like baby. <laughs> but they like see new life come into the world and then mm-hmm. it's like it's gone. It's weird. Yeah. It it just feels like in a weird way it just kind of goes against nature. Yeah. East of Burns Lake, they trudge forth past the area where Roxanne Tiara was found shortly after Ramona went missing. Near the elementary school in Prince George, they pass the site where Elisa Germain's body was found, followed by the gas station where Nicole Hoare was last seen. A vast stretch of many, many miles, or I guess kilometers, whatever. (laughs) By either measure, it's a lot of walking. And it makes up the journey that snakes all along the stretch of highway where many loved ones were lost. By making the walk, they honor all of the victims regardless of the status of their case. Oh, I was going to ask you that later. I'd like to share with you the list of names that while a fraction of the sum total of victims on the Highway of Tears are those that have been assigned to Epana. Like... Gloria Moody, Micheline Pear, Gail Ways, Pamela Darlington, Monica Ignaz, Colleen McMillan, Monica Jack, Maureen Mosey, Shelley Ann Bascu, Alberta Williams, Delphine Nicole, Ramona Wilson, Roxanne Tiara, Alicia Germain, Lana Derrick, Nicole Hoare, Tamara Chipman, and Ayla Sarek Auger. And a lot of what was shared in the book that I read about the Highway of Tears about Ayla's upbringing, her family, um, the circumstances around her disappearance, all of that. I just, it literally ripped me in half to read it. And all of these are so incredibly sad, but it was um, towards the end of kind of 
me working through what I could realistically fit into what I wanted, you know, to kind of cover with this case and how, how much ground can I cover here? And I just thought, I don't think I have it in me because it is just, and I can't tell you why there was so much about her and her case and her family that just stuck out to me, but it was just heartbreaking. And hearing the accounts from her brother, Mm. it just, it's awful to see kids that grow up in homes that are already marked by tragedy and so much strife. And then this is how their incredibly short life ends. Colleen McMillan, who we've already talked about in a super recent episode, was confirmed as a victim of Bobby Jack Fowler when he was living and working in the area based on DNA evidence. And there are two other names that did make the e list that he's also believed to be responsible for. Gail Ways and Pamela Darlington, mm. who we briefly touched on in that episode as well. Some have even speculated further and implicated him in Delphine's disappearance. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Then there's also the inception of Red Dress Day. It takes place on May 5th each year. I'm just going to say it, you guys. Synchronicity. Everything that I have done in these recent weeks in terms of research, I was meant to find. Each of these was a literal little stepping stone from what felt like coincidences to something much bigger. It hooked me, and while I felt so deeply infuriated and really processed so much hurt through all of this. I've also processed a lot of healing and that's probably all I'm ever going to say on the topic. (laughs) But these stories are important to me because though they're so vastly different from my own in so many ways, they are just like mine. Okay, gross. We're going (laughs) to Irish goodbye on the feels now because, wow, they're gross. Um, And get back to Red Dress Day. This feels a little eerie to be reading this next part, um, specifically after yesterday's events. As women in the world, we face a lot that's ugly and hurtful. But indigenous women at such astronomically disproportionate rates. It's not the first time this has come up in one of our cases, but the sheer weight of it really hits home in this one. The public display of red dresses is meant to draw attention to missing and murdered indigenous women women across Canada and the United States. The National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls has been marked with marches and processions every year, with communities asking governments and authorities to take more action. If this is something you can participate in, it's a small step you can take to show your support. Attending such an event can help us become more aware of the opportunities available to help as well. You're going to want to scroll all the way down to the bottom of the show notes this week if that's not something you typically do. I promise it's really easy, but I can't encourage you enough to use the resources that I've gathered as a springboard to really educate yourself in this arena. It's absolutely the tip of the iceberg. 
But if this calls to you even a little bit, it'll get you started. Oh, I definitely will read about it. So, um, I know they have them here in the United States, but can we can we go to Canada for the next one? Yeah, let's go. I'm down. God, I forgot how much this one hurt. It was, it's been a little while since we recorded episode one. Yeah, it's heavy. It was a really good one. And there's just so many people that we couldn't really talk about. And there's so many other cases that, you know, like I said, they don't fit into that really narrow description you know there's yeah. all that criteria which it doesn't seem like that much and on the surface it seems like that should help us to narrow down to kind of the cases that really that are really related to the highway itself and get down to the root problem which is that we don't have you know safe reliable transportation in that area there's you know an exceeding amount of violence against the indigenous population. It just, there's just, it's just not possible for there to only be that many names on that list. Yeah. That's how I know that that criteria doesn't work. Yeah. Because there's so many other cases. And in the documentary, we, you know, meet a man who went into law enforcement and his mother was one of those women oh. that why she didn't fit the criteria I don't know maybe it was 1968 instead of yeah the cut off year 1969 to like how would they know like I just oh they're just you know And I get it. I'm sure it's an overwhelming number of cases if we look at all of them. But can we look at all of them? Can can we look at all of them? Yeah, because you never know. Like the there might be clues in the other ones that would help you out in these ones. Yeah, and also just solve all of them. Yeah, they all need to be solved. Also, just like actually investigate all of them. Jeez. Yeah. So. All right. Well, to the tarot. If there's a red dress on this card, I'm going to lose We're going to literally poop. Well, I am. <laughs> Caitlin will not. Yes, as you know, that would be quite impossible for me. So. Oh, my gosh. Okay. okay. Just go. They're so stiff, it's, like, hard to get them. That was a pretty good shuffle. Mm-hmm. They're too stiff. <laughs> Did you put your vibes into it? Yep, I put my very presidential hands all over it. (laughs) Have you noticed that I'm just a big old box of sass today? Today? (laughs) Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every day. (laughs) Darling. Okay. Do you think people think I'm doing, like, magic under here? Like Probably sleight of hand. Yeah, don't pay oh, look, attention to what's ten under of the desk. Is up again there. Ooh. That's interesting. I just because I don't want to make all that clatter on the mics, you know. Yeah, we don't have our spare desk. Yeah, <laughs> where we try to do it away from the mics. Yeah. <laughs> so you know cute. what I mean? Okay. Okay. A card for insight into the highway of tears. Okay. Okay. It is the. T- who? Two of Swords? Two of Swords in reverse. I don't know why. I'm just feeling like, oof. Is there a... Oh, I don't know. I don't... I think this is one we haven't gotten yet, too. This is a pretty card. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Two of Swords keywords are combined resources. Oh, okay. Like a a task force or a symposium. (laughs) Interesting. Okay. Courage, faith, friendship, conflict, balance. Wow. In some tarot decks, this card depicts a blindfolded woman holding two swords crossed over her chest. 
Twos generally signify balance or conflict, as well as pairing. I think of the Two of Swords as the blind faith card because it can represent courage and making decisions based on your own truth, and in some cases, spiritual guidance. Cassie. Wow. The card that Paul drew was the Ten of Swords. Mm -hmm. And I was saying we have to talk about that because we're talking about the zombie apocalypse. And then there's a connection. It's, yeah, I got (laughs) to connect the dots. And then I was talking about how the Ten of Swords made me think of Michonne Mm -hmm. from The Walking Dead. Yeah. Because she had the two swords. Interesting. That's so weird. This I was is the wrong episode. <laughs> I know, but I was literally talking about it right before we started, you yeah. know, recording on this weird. next one. I don't know. I just thought that was, I don't know. All the swords. Pod today. dogs, calm down over there. Reversed, the two of swords often indicates confusion or conflict with yourself or someone else. An imbalance may cause stress or frustration. I'd say. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes this card urges you to take action rather than endlessly analyzing a situation. You can't see ahead, but you must take a leap of faith. Wow. In a reading about money, this card suggests worrying about a financial matter. You don't know what to do and can't trust anyone to help you. The reverse two can indicate choosing between two unsatisfactory options. Wow. Cassie. (sighs) I was literally talking about this case, not even thinking about the fact that we were going to record it, but we were watching a new show on Netflix and they were talking about how gamers swat each other. Have you heard of this? No. As a prank, they send the SWAT team to your house. Like for like in real life? Yes. Oh, like a real SWAT team. That's not good. And in this episode, there's a case where it ends badly. And it costs upwards of $10,000 every time they have to send out the SWAT team to respond to a situation. And here I am walking around our hotel room, just like whisper screaming about, oh, sure, we have all of the money in the world to send the SWAT team out on every little fake call that we get. But we don't have, you know, a few hundred bucks to put up flyers for all of these missing women on the highway of tears. Wow. (laughs) I'm just, that's crazy. (laughs) If the reading is about your job, the reverse two represents confusion, indecision, lack of information, or conflicts regarding your work. It can also warn that colleagues aren't reliable or trustworthy. You need to look hard at something you don't want to see. Huh. I mean, it definitely speaks to, you know, lack of opportunity for education and gainful employment for a lot of the people that live out in these communities. Yeah. I was thinking about the police. (laughs) Yeah, you probably need that. Yeah. All of that. Look, not looking at something you, what did it say? (laughs) I saw it's, you need to look hard at something you don't want to see. That. It can also warn that colleagues aren't reliable or trustworthy. That's where it got me in relation to. In a reading about love, confusion or differences of opinion may cause stagnation in a relationship. Are you clashing swords? Honesty and openness are important now. The reverse too also represents imbalance. One person may wield more power than the other Mm. I think there's far too many examples of an imbalance of power all throughout this yeah for sure I just (laughs) wow I don't know why but for some reason I didn't expect this card to resonate for me and um well it did I'm a fucking idiot so it did but damn it if I can't pick a good tarot card 
Yeah, she can. <laughs> she doesn't have a red dress, but she has red hair. Yeah. I think it's really interesting, too, that it's somebody who's blindfolded. Yeah. She has swords, but she's blindfolded. It's like it speaks to a vulnerability that makes me very uncomfortable when we're talking yeah. about these cases. It reminds me of like just the families and friends too. Like they're ready to fight, yeah. but they can't. Like I know they don't know what to do. Yeah, I think that kind of imagery is really. I mean, it's applicable yeah. in a couple ways. Wow. <sighs> well, are we ever going to talk about this again? Do you think the Highway of Tears? Yeah, like possibly. Yeah. Yeah, because there's so much. There really is. And there, you know, we talked about um, off mic, haha, some of the other cases that don't fit neatly. Yeah. And some of those you're talking about multiple people that have gone missing and or murdered at the same time. So unfortunately, the High We of Tears is just a hotbed of different things that I feel like, you know, people need to hear those stories. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. All, All right. right. Do you feel okay. drained after tarot now? Like I just feel like energy drained after we'll a little bit sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like it was right on. So, oh yeah, it's, for sure. <laughs> I feel like it's worth it, but it was, yeah, Ooh. we probably need a snack. Yeah. yeah, snack time. All right, you guys, okay. I think we're going to call it. All right. Have, Have a, a creepy ass, ass day. See, See you next Tuesday. Tuesday. Don't hitchhike. Yeah. Also, don't play with swords blindfolded. Yeah, Just maybe don't do that. As an aside. <laughs> So for all of you that are listening, if you have any true crime or paranormal stories that you want us to share, maybe with the whole Pacific Northwest. Yes, we would love <laughs> to read them on the pod. Yes, we will read them out loud. <laughs> Not just in our heads. Yes. <laughs> they don't have to be from the Pacific Northwest. If you would like to share, email us at PNW Hunts and Homicides at gmail.com. It's all spelled out, no special characters. Super duper easy peasy. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Same thing as the email at PNW Hunts and Homicides, all spelled out, no special characters. Please also rate and review us on whatever platform you're listening to and check out our stories on social media because our meme game is hot. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and if you agree, like Caitlin, you can also find us on Patreon and support the show. Bitchin'. <laughs>